Yeah. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rasmus Bro. I'm from University of Copenhagen, uh, and we are uh, lucky enough that we have Ricard Bouquet and Jokin. Oh, uh, that would be Esenaro. Esenaro, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from uh, I will say University of uh, Tarragona. Um, that's the short version of that. Uh, from uh, the northern part, northeast part of uh, Spain. And they have made something which is very interesting, uh, uh, an automatic tool uh, for looking into spectral pre-processing. So I'm looking very much uh, forward to hearing about that. And the floor is yours. I, I might add that if you have comments, questions, put them in the chat, and then I will uh, relay them when I find it uh, feasible. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much, Rasmus, for the, for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to share this, this work, which is, I would say, the first thing I have to say is that a preliminary work, because it's, the paper has not yet been submitted. It will be soon. But I think when you propose us to, to, to give the seminar, we thought that this could be a, an interesting topic. You know, preprocessing is always a hot topic. And well, some of the ideas may, may, may be of your interest. So we decided finally to present this, OK? but. Is it still open for discussion, probably? And, and most of you maybe will have questions and we'll see. Uh, the idea is that uh, we have developed uh, an expert tool, let's say, to perform preprocessing. We have called Expert PLS, although the name may be subject also to changes because it's, it's, it's a tool for preprocessing. The, the, the thing is that after preprocessing, the different uh, alternatives, a PLS model is built to check whether the preprocessing alternatives uh, are good enough or not, okay? And we we have built it in a way of a toolbox that is uh, open uh, on, on request. Uh, so if you send us a message, an email or whatever, we will send it to you just for you to check to play with it, okay? Very good. Can you hear me well? I, I guess so, eh? Uh Yes, everything is perfect, thanks. Okay, so different steps of spectral data analysis, because many, uh, most of you know it. The first step is data creation. That means removing uh, outliers, gross outliers, removing missing data um, or sensor data even. This is the first step in always in, in data analysis. Second step normally is uh, pre-processing mm -hmm of the uh, spectral data uh, to remove unwanted uh, variation that is not related to the property of interest that we want to model or predict. Next step, of course, is modeling. Let's say a PCA or a classification model of PLS. In this case, the, the, the toolbox is, is validated with PLS models. And last step, of, co of course, after modeling is validation. Of course, all these steps are connected and are not performed in a linear way, let's say, because after validation, maybe we remodel, we reprocess, we do to data curation again. So all is interconnected and the process is not really linear. So many interactions between these four steps are, are performed. So also the trial, most of the times it's a trial and error procedure, okay? Data, data analysis, right? Today we will talk basically about preprocessing, although the, the toolbox that Joachim will show you later also perform some data creation. Let's say we can remove outliers. Of course, PLS models are built to check the validity of the performance of the of the algorithms, and of course, it's also validated. So, but basically, it's about preprocessing. Uh, well, and uh, is, you know all the importance of preprocessing, eh? but we just remind it a little bit. Of course, preprocessing can improve models uh, very significantly. Uh, just extracting the real information that uh, is, is useful for us, eh? for chemistrians and for data analysts. Uh, some errors uh, induced by a spectra collection can be instrumental, can be due to the sample, like, like the scattering effects, temperature drifts, poor reproducibility. This is the, the main things that we want to remove from the data, from the spectra that we collect, okay? Um, of course, if you choose the right reprocessing of the data, uh, we get better models, huh? ideally optimal models, PCA, PLS, or whatever. But uh, the, the 
choosing a bad preprocessing can spoil models, of course. So this is a critical step and a, and a tricky step, I would say, okay? Because basically what we want in the spectra is a variation that reflects the properties of the sample. Huh? And hopefully nothing else, huh? nothing due to instrument or to physical state or temperature effects or whatever, right? So uh, there are multiple ways to classify, classify the different algorithms, okay? In this, in this work, we have classified them based on how they are applied in, in normal or real cases rather than other theoretical criteria. And in this way, we have divided in, in four main uh, categories. Let's say first one is a smoothing that of course reduces noise, those increasing signal to noise ratio uh, to have a better signal. Uh, in the toolbox, we have implemented these three types of uh, smoothing, Gaussian smoothing, savitsky golai smoothing, and also wavelet denoising, which is applied basically to Raman spectra. This is a, is a good uh, a good denoising uh, algorithm, wavelet denoising for Raman spectra. So the three are, are implemented depending on the type of spectra. Second group is derivatives that uh, may enhance the small uh, peaks, small features. Uh, also noise, of course, is not correctly applied and may also remove uh, sometimes scattering. So in this case, we have applied, we applied two types of, uh, one is differentiation and the other one is savitsky golai derivatives, first and second, okay, derivatives. Third category or third group is sample-wise normalization that uh, is intended or the purpose is to minimize the scattering effects and also baseline drifts. And in this group, we can we may find standard normal variate as indeed the trending or baseline correction. In this case, asymmetric is the squares, which is a, a baseline correction method that works pretty well, eh? according to us. And the last one is variable-wise normalization that it's intended to just to give all variables the same, uh, the same uh, importance. Eh? And it sometimes it has to be applied. Of course, mean centering, which is by default applied normally, in PLS or PCA, and also autoscaling, which is the other one, right? These four groups of methods are implemented in this in this toolbox. Um, okay, the, then the, the the big question is coming: uh, how to decide what preprocessing to try, or what combination of preprocessing to try? Uh, this requires, I would say, uh, some experience, uh, or at least so knowledge of the data and the effects that may be present and so on. So uh, that's an important thing. For people not so experienced, uh, sometimes the approach, the easier approach is just trial and error. Okay, just, just uh, trying different uh, preprocessing steps, uh, combinations of them, and then just checking how the final results of the models are. This may not produce the optimal models, okay? Because uh, it's a tricky, as we said, okay? So what to do? Uh, several approaches have been proposed, in fact, in literature to guide the analyst in the, in the pre-processing step, okay? Uh, we will mention two of them, which are, first one is uh, a sport, okay? which is a method developed by uh, Jean-Michel Roger and uh, Italian people, uh, Alessandra and Federico Marini, already published very, quite recently, three years ago. So uh, data pre-processed with different methods, some, many methods, we would say. And then all the different blocks that are generated for the different pre-processings, and you have different data sets with, with different pre-processings are joined together and a multi-block modeling approach uh, of the type uh, um, sequentially orthogonalized PLS is applied uh, to this uh, to these blocks. Uh, so it means that uh, the the second block uh, is orthogonalized with respect to the first one, and then the Y is predicted well. It, for details on the on the procedure on the procedure, you can you can go to the original paper. But basically, it's a multi-block approach uh, taking into account the different preprocessing applied. Okay. And finally, uh, it has to be decided what is the best one or if more than one is needed yeah, with this approach. Second one was proposed some years ago. In this case, it's uh, 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 2015 by the, well, the group of uh, Ludger Boydens. In this case, the author is Gerritsen. 
uh, and it's based on the uh, design of experiments. Uh, the selection of the optimal preprocessing is based on design of experiments. That is a full factorial design is, is created using um, a, a, a different preprocessing method in different groups, which is a smooth thing, a scatter effects, baseline correction, and uh, variable normalization. And in one, one method is applied for each of these groups. Uh, in the original work, is SMV for the scatter correction is uh, asymmetric list of squares for baseline, Savitsky Goli for smoothing, and I think Pareto scaling for uh, variable normalization. So uh, a design of experiment is for, performed. All these combinations are tried. And then uh, based on the response surface, the method that significantly affect the model performance or the methods with lower error, let's say, are selected as the optimal ones, okay? That is the idea. In our case, uh, well, we propose uh, a slightly different alternative because, uh, well, these approaches uh, may be a, a little bit complex and, and sometimes computationally time consuming. Okay? And many methods have to be tried, which is, uh, or in some cases, a subjective selection of the methods uh, is, is performed. Uh, then, of course, you have to build all the models for all these uh, combinations. In our case, the idea is that with the, the expert PLS toolbooks, expertise is introduced a little bit yeah? in, in, in two ways. It det detects and quantifies the noise and also the scatter that is present in the data. And according to that, some methods, uh, preprocessing techniques are tried or not, depending on how the, the test on noise and the scatter uh, results, right? By doing this uh, this procedure or the, with this idea, try and modeling data only with methods that make sense for the data at hand, we can save up up to 80% of the computational time. So it's, uh, as a let's say, a, a different alternative for that. Okay. So for a smooth thing, uh, what we need is to quantify a spectral noise. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, first, the data set is average. So spectra are average, and we have an average spectrum that we can see in the in the plot. Okay. Then the first derivative of the average is calculated. Okay, this one. After that, zeros are found, or values where let's say uh, close to zero are found, which correspond correspond to the maximum and maxima and minima of the original spectra, okay? And selected with this, you can see the, the zeros with this red line, showing these red lines, okay? Next step is to count between consecutive uh, red lines, let's say, with, between consecutive zeros, the number of points that are contained there. So in this case would be for the, for the first and second, second and third. And you count the number of points between these zeros, right? Um, after that, the average number of points for the whole spectrum is calculated. And this is a measure of the noise of the spectrum. This is number is used as an indicative window size for smoothing algorithms, as it is big enough to have a smoothing effect and small enough not to lose uh, important peaks in the spectrum, okay? So that's the approach that we propose in this case for the uh, smoothing part. So this is the guided uh, expertise for the smoothing. Eh? In, the, in this case, the, the, well, the zeros, the, in this case, correspond to the maximum, maxima and minima of the original, in this case, Raman spectrum. Eh? Right. For the scatter effects, we do, uh, uh, of course, a different approach, but also we quantify scatter effects. We use a scatter effect plot eh? to, to quantify these effects. How it performs. So it's a spectrum. It's plotted a spectrum in the data set, let's say, is plotted against the average spectrum or the mean spectrum. And then a linear regression is fit to each of these plots, right? And you can represent this, this final plot of, of the different uh, regression uh, lines, right? After that, the relative standard deviation between slopes and the uh, uh, relative standard deviation between offsets are calculated. And in this case, if uh, these uh, standard deviations in relative terms between slopes offsets 
are higher than 5%, we consider that the FX weather, either, sorry, multiplicative or additive are non negligible. And we can consider them and so apply the corresponding method for a scatter correction. In the case of uh, uh, additive or multiplicative, it, it, can, it can change. It can be SNV or can be a, a symmetric list of squares or the turning or whatever, right? But the process is also guided. So not all methods will be applied, just depending on whether the multiplicative or additive effects are present or not. Okay? This is just an example uh, of some uh, forage uh, sample spectra. Yeah? So a spectra of forage, uh, forage samples. You have the original spectra, row spectra, and then you have the scatter plot. Okay? In this way, you can see that here additive and multiplicative uh, terms are present in this case. As a way of example, if, uh, we can show also what what uh, these uh, scatter plots look like after we perform a given preprocessing. In this case, for instance, first derivative, you can see that the multiplicative effects are still present, but not so the additive ones. Okay, this is can, can you can see it quite clearly in this kind of plots. If you perform a symmetric list of squares as a baseline correction uh, reprocessing, then you can even see more clearly that uh, the multiplicative effects are present, but not additive effects. And in the last case, with the trending, you can see that, well, the, the effect of the additive and multiplicative terms is, has diminished considerably in this case, okay? Of course, the algorithm that we implement in the toolbox is based on the original uh, spectra. Yeah, that in this case we saw that they should you know, they show additive and multiplicative effects in this case. Good. So the automation of this uh, toolbox or this preprocessing toolbox is is the following. So we have the data set uh, is is the, the algorithm and the toolbox is thought basically for uh, vibrational spectroscopy or let's say UV visible uh, near infrared. Uh, mid infrared and, and Raman spectra, not so for uh, for mass spectrometry, for instance. Okay, so it's for for a spectrum of this type. Yeah? So we have the data. First, we check whether they are noisy data or not with the algorithm that I showed previously. Is it noisy data? Then we perform smoothing, and if not, we can go to derivatives. Of course, you can go to the derivatives also after applying the smoothing. So this is. All the models will be created, all the combinations in this case. Data, we can also check simultaneously baseline shift of drift or scatter effects, okay? And we can decide if yes, we can perform sample-wise normalization, SMV, for instance. And if not, then we go to the last step, which is variable-wise normalization. Okay? Of course, many combinations are, are, are calculated, but not all. Uh, depending on the, if the data are noisy or they show uh, scattered effects. Okay, so it's a process a little bit guided in this in this way. Okay, <laughs> for every new preprocessing, that can be only smoothing. Okay, imagine that your data is, uh, needs only to be smooth. Uh, a new data set is created, smooth data. You can smooth and also calculate first derivative with Savitsky Golai. Then is another data set. You can do this and also this. Uh, uh, after that, apply SMV, then you have another data set. And for each data set, a PLS model is built, okay? And then we will see in the, this last part, how we decide for the optimal, for the optimal model, okay? And we decide it based on model performance evaluation, okay? The, the toolbox offers uh, three possibilities. One is the root mean square error of cross-validation that you can see here in the, in the equation. You can also check the uh, determination coefficient for cross-validation, which is this uh, equation that takes in, into account the covariance between X and Y and the standard deviation of the, of the X and the Y. And finally, uh, a new model performance uh, indicator that we have developed and that is already uh, published. This, this is already published very recently, which is, we call it uh, G-score. The G uh, should mean join a score, but 
some people think that the, is the name of Jokin, which is the author of that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, know, you can say it, but it's, in principle it's joint score, okay? Because it combines three, diff three parameters. First one, is the ratio between the root mean square error of cross validation divided by the standard deviation of the y values in the original data match mix. We call it normalized error. And if you remember or you recall it, is the inverse of the RPD indicator, right? This gives an idea of the normalized error of the, of the data. Second uh, parameter is one minus the ratio between errors of calibration and cross-validation, root mean square error of calibration and, and validation. This measure gives an idea of the overfitting of the model, right? And final um, indicator is the noise index of the regression vector that can also be calculated and gives an idea also, let's say about overfitting, but, but uh, of the robustness because, uh, well, the model, re uh, how it works a little bit, uh, rapidly or quickly, uh, the model regression vector is smooth. Then the residual between the row and the smooth vector is calculated. And then the normalized sum of the values of these uh, residual values is the noise index uh, of the regression vector. Uh, important to say that all these indicators, all these three indicators range, range from zero to one. Zero meaning uh, optimal performance, or in this case, optimal um, num optimal number of latent variables in the model, let's say, okay? optimal performance. Uh, as they are, all of them range from zero to one. If you divide by three, you calculate the average, then the final G score, so ranges from zero to one, okay? So uh, values close to zero, uh, uh, better than values close to one, right? So that's the idea. And I think I finished my part. And now Joaquin will show you the, the algorithm itself and the, and the toolbox and we can play and we illustrate with a couple of examples of interest. Thank you. Sure. So let's go to MATLAB now. That's the thing we know. I'll close the things that have opened. Well, this will be I'll show you rapidly. This will be the whole decision tree that we simplified in the presentation. But yeah, it's it, it has all the indicators quantified to decide what to try, what to not. And let's say that, for example, uh, for instance, the PLX toolbox has a, a similar tool that it's, you tell them what preprocessing you want to try. And the PLX toolbox iterates all the combinations. This can, This case will be something similar, but instead of trying all the combinations, it tries only the combinations that make sense based on the indicators that we have decided. That's the noise index and the, the offset, uh, the offset and slope per CDs. Residues, sorry. So I have the example of the forages loaded. It is an interesting, well, I've opened the PPLS toolbox that has a friendly user inter interface. I hope. Well, the 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 example I I'm going to try first is uh, the forage uh, example that Ricard explained for the scatter effects, and it's an interesting uh, uh, example because it's published in a paper by Ruiz Sanchez et al. That uh, the it's the aim of the study is to differentiate the different models produced by different laboratories or analysts. So, in that example which I have here. I'll open this. These are on the heat map, heat map of the left. You can see the all the models proposed by the six laboratories that you can see they are not a uh, convergent at all. Uh, each each analyst or each laboratory proposed a, a different preprocessing with a different performance with different yeah, everything, different lab, lab, uh, number of uh, latent variables too. This is uh, the paper of the NGE score, which is. We use the same example. So yeah, on the right, you can see the, the same models evaluated by the JS score. And you can see that it coincides with the 416 laboratories, but all of the rest are, are very dispersed, let's say. So I will try. So I will try with the EPLS toolbox now. Let's see what happens. 
first uh, we have to load the the forage spectra, which I have on my workspace, you can see. And I'll try to predict humidity, which is the same as sample. First, we can plot the spectra. And you can see there is no evidential layers by it's it. And the, the y values that you can see, they follow pretty well a, a Gaussian curve. Well, this is the first uh, first step of watching if your data is correct or really biased towards something. But in this case, it's really OK. Then we have to decide how to validate the models that we are going to create. In this case, the toolbox implements the random subsets uh, k-fold cross-validation. With five folds, it will be nice, I believe. It's a 20% out for the cross-validation. And then we have to tell the toolbox if we are, our data is a uh, UV near mirror, which has a very Gaussian peaks, very wide peaks most of the time, or Raman, which has a very sharp peaks, peaks and we have to try, uh, for instance, wavelet denoising or not. That works very well in this type of data. Then we have to tell how many number of Balaton variables to calculate for each model. To, well, it doesn't mean that the optimal will be 10, but the optimal will be found between the 10 in order not to, to calculate too many or too few. Uh, and the first step will be to look for outliers. It uh, performs a simple PCA model on the data, sorry, PLS model with raw data. And then we can see the, the usual control chart, which is the Q residual and throttling. Maybe this one will be an outlier. We can see already that with the raw data, it's a pretty good model, but we will see with the with preprocessing if it's better or not. So we can select this one as an outlier, for instance, and start analysis. This analysis will automatically decide if it's noisy, if it has a uh, scatter effects or not, and do the consequent uh, preprocessing methods, apply them, and uh, build all the, the, the preprocessed data data sets that will be used for PLS model building after all. So let's start. So yeah, it's deciding what the metrics to use. It's applying the preprocessings. And after iterating, it decided that they had to try 137 preprocessing methods. And they are on the with the ones that we commented on all the iterations because the as Ricard said, and the even if the indicative smoothing window is 15, it also may be 17, 19, or 13. So the ones are that are near the indicative uh, number are tried too. If it is decided that the spectra is noisy, which I think in this case is, we are uh, waiting for the all the PLS models to be fitted for all the 137 dat data sets that have been created. And we finish when it finishes, we will see the the summary of the of the results. Yeah. Well, maybe before watching the results, I will look at the the outputs of the of the toolbox. The third one is the report. The report, well, no, it's loading, so yeah, it doesn't open yet. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So here is the report. The first report is uh, the all the inputs that we have uh, put in the uh, SPT PLS toolbox. The first output is the indicative window of the smoothing. This tells that this has 174 variables, spectral variables. And this tells us that the indicative uh, optimal window for the smoothing algorithms or derivative algorithms is uh, Savitsky Golai will be 11, but also 9, 7, 13, 15 are tried. <coughs> also, the this is the noise index calculated to be, as well as to decide if it's uh, worth trying smoothing algorithms or not. The the limit is set at 5. This is 4, 5. Oh, sorry, this, the, the limit is set at 2. So the as the noise index is 4.5, it is considered as noisy spectra. 
and the smooth uh, algorithms are tried. Then the slope of RCD of, of slopes and RCD of uh, coordinate origins or offsets is calculated. And if it's uh, as it is uh, above five, the, yeah. they are considered to be present. So the, those algorithms are tried too. So now I'll show you the, the results. This is the result table, which comes with a filtering tool. And these are all the models that have been created by the EPLS. You can see the first columns show the, the preprocessing that have been applied to that, uh, that specific uh, data set, the one of the 137. For instance, this one has been applied a seven window, seven point window Gaussian smoothing, no derivative, SMP normalization, and no to scaling. This is only misentering. If we click, for instance, one model, we can open it. It opens here. And it shows all the, all the normal metrics that we use usually with the PLS uh, models. You can see it's a really good model. And the minimum uh, of the optimal Latin number of Latin variables, it's selected by the J score, not by the RMC, which is a more, more comprehensive indicator, we believe. In this case, uh, it is a good model, but maybe not the best model. It also more other number of large variables can be can be observed. The model is repressed as it's built previously. For instance, someone could say, you, looking at this curve, that the optimal is five, five for instance. But we can see that the improvement is not is not significant enough to add two latent variables, and I will stick with the J scores decisions. But then we can select the best preprocessing that we are here for that. Uh, we can select, we can order the, all the models that have been built according to the J score, which will be this one, Gaussian, 11 point window, SMV, no auto scaling, and three Latin variables. If you use a RMC of cross validation, it will be another one, which is Savisky Colai 15 points, no derivative. SMV and auto scaling. Of course, the top of the list doesn't mean it is the best model. As you can see, all of the top models have really similar uh, indicators. That means that in in more than one iteration of the same cross validation, this these numbers can be interchanged. So the first one doesn't need to be the first one. It could be the fifth one the next time. So the it is not a toolbox that gives you the best preprocessing uh, method by uh, categorical imperatives, but it is uh, a toolbox that offers you a list of the best preprocessing models, you could say. For instance, we can order them by JSCore again, and we can see that the first three ones are the same, but with different point windows. So yeah, this is, will be an, this will be interchangeable uh, models. Well, this one has six Latin variables, but doesn't matter. And then we have also the, the no preprocessed uh, model mm -hmm. that if you remember in the paper, it's the one sorry, in the paper is the one selected by labs four and six. So yeah, it makes sense that it's on the top, but maybe using a Gaussian smoothing and SMB, it's a better model, you could say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the idea is not to determine which is the very best model, but if you looking at the list, you can see a consensus of which preprocessing makes sense to uh, you can see that this indeed is a noisy data. So the best models have a, a smoothing algorithm. It also is a, a data with a with a scattering effect. So SMV is present in all the good models. And auto scale and mean centering are really not that decisive. They never are in, in infrared spectroscopy, but yeah, you can see they are never here. And the Latin variable number, that also changes too. Maybe the three one is better, but maybe you want a very robust one that with the one Latin variable is able, able to predict the same. I don't know, maybe that's also, I mean, the non-expert panelist will use the best one, I guess, but it's it's uh, 
it's a matter of of experience also to try more things or but if they are already here that in a list that they tell you what has makes has a, a sense to try or not it, i think it really helps i don't know how much time i was taking but yeah yeah we have a, a bit of time more so maybe i can try another data set or not oh well i forgot the the filtering tool i think in this case it seems that there is another outlier when you show the plot uh, yeah maybe there is i didn't see when you see the space yeah the space this could be outliers that have been not authentic well it's as we said, it's not a linear process, so you can go to the beginning, to the beginning. remove the, so remove the layers, and start the process again. Okay. And yeah, this uh, the toolbox also outputs the all the data sets have, that have been uh, created. Here is the, the process spectra for all the data sets. Here are the, the statistics and the, and the RMS curves and JSCore curves. So, so you can recall all the yeah, things. or maybe it's 37. Maybe I can stop here and no. leave time for questions. No. No, example. Maybe another example. <laughs> what do you say? Rasmus, do you have time for another example? Oh, we have lots of time. Yes, yes. Okay, Go ahead. okay good. So I'll close the EPLS and start from scratch again. Maybe I can do a uh, this is a wine fermentation spectra and the pH is being predicted. So we will try this one, which is uh, yeah, you can see this is MIR and the the reference values are not that Gaussian anymore. We will do the same validation. It is MIR and the same natural variables. I forgot to say that the toolbox also has the the option to iterate all the preprocessings, no matter the the properties of the raw, da raw data. This is if it's noisy or not, or if it has scatter effects or not. This will try uh, try every iteration just as the just as the PLS toolbox does. So yeah, but I will do the quick quick one. We don't have that much time. It takes time. Right? Yeah. In this case, as the data set is bigger, it's 400 times uh, 800. The bigger the data set, the bigger the, the time for the PLS to build. So we know. In the meantime, there's a question uh, that, uh, in the chat uh, about outliers, how you handle outliers. Uh, in this case, the, the outlier that I selected is removed from the raw data set and it is uh, ignored. Let's say the, the process will be the same, but without that sample. Right. This, this, this toolbox doesn't really do anything else with the, the outliers. If you decide it's, a, it's an outlier, it's removed. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And the look for outliers button here gives you just a model on the currently selected data. Yeah, uh, it, it gives you the, the PLS with the raw data. Mm -hmm. I was doubting to include the PCA or the PLS, but I think more outliers are detected in the PLS models because it based, it's based on the covariance of the Y. So also outliers of the Y are detected. So yeah, it's, it does, uh, it builds a, a, a basic model with the raw data and a PLS model. And the, the regular metrics are shown. Of course, there, is, there are more there, there are more tools to select outliers, but the only the usual ones ones are uh, included in here. Yeah, there's the hotel in T square and the, the Q residuals. You have the scores with an interval ellipse and uh, yeah, the, the predicted and measured. So yeah. That's where you usually find outliers. Right. There's also another question. Um, when when you quantify for multiplicative and additive effect, is there a reason why you use MSC and not SNV? In the rest of your algorithm, you're using SNV. No, we are using SNV. MSC is not here. Ah. MSC, sorry. 
Yes. Okay. So you're only using okay. SME. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. From, from my experience. Yeah, sorry. Just, you, because you're looking at the slope and the offset of a line, you make a linear regression between yeah. the average, and that's MSC. So that's why I was just. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's it's the previous step. It's the same as MSC. Yeah. That was just in, instead you could also have used um, just the standard deviation and the um, average of the each spectrum, and then you sort of uh, then you're using the same statistics yeah. throughout uh, your method building. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe I it's could. just a small suggestion. It's a uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but I think usually, well, what I the places I looked the the scatter plot based on the MSC is more spread, I believe. So yeah. A matter of consensus, maybe <laughs> consensus. Still a couple of minutes. <laughs> yes, but indeed, as, as Osman also uh, writes, it's a very nice idea you have with screening, uh, which pre-processing is relevant. That's a very very nice uh, functionality. I like that a lot. Yeah, well, I need to test it more because, well, I have tried several samples of four course, and in almost step one, in all, in all cases, the, the optimal preprocessing is in the ones that the EPLS suggests. Yeah. And in the rest, uh, in the, the, the result, the rest one, the, the one that didn't work, it was in the iterate all preprocessing system. So, yeah. In fact, this morning we were trying uh, a synthetic data set. And mm -hmm. With in principle no need for preprocessing, and the and the algorithm finds that the the, the optimal model is with no preprocessing, so it's yeah. it's robust. So it's, uh, that's nice. But there's another question. Someone who was a bit worried that they can't buy it. Will you put it for sale? You said you would make it freely available. Um, yeah. 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 So, we are. We will make it freely available, but. We are not responsible for, responsible for the results. That's the the counterpart. Yes, yes, of course. Okay, uh, but I guess the question also is: uh, Will you put it on some website, or or, or would uh, people just have to mail you? Uh, we will decide when we publish the article. We, we believe it's it's in the alpha stage right now. So yeah, if you really want to use it now, you can email us, and probably we will send it to you. And when the article is published, it will be in our repository. Yeah. Okay, the the results are here. And if we order them by J score, we can see again that the optimal one is only the Gaussian. But this time the toolbox decided that the spectra doesn't have uh, any scatter effects. So SMV is not tried, the trending is not tried, as you can see. And it makes sense the you saw the the spectra. It's uh it's really overlapping. The the baseline is doesn't have a really big shift yeah. on the majority of this part. The, the baseline is overlapped. So yeah. No offset effects there. But for instance, we can see one which is the Gaussian, it's nine, nine Latin variables. The one, this model is published in another article by this group, and the, the optimal was uh, proposed as Gaussian, sorry, the Savitsky Golai with um, seven Latin variables. So, yeah, that's subject, that was subjective at this time. Yeah, you can see nine or seven doesn't really make a change. Yeah, the outliers are a bit more overlapped, but that's not the point. And as you can see here, the noise of the regression vector it does really matter when selecting the, the number of latent variables. You can see with one, it's really smooth. With five, even, it's really smooth. But when we go to eight, nine, ten, it starts modeling some noise. That, that is what we don't want, really, in a model for it to be robust. So, yeah, that's. The J score really helps with that because if you have this uh, this slope or this curve, I don't know where you select it, but I don't know. Maybe I will select three. <laughs> Maybe I will select eleven. I don't know. And with the J score, it has a, a 
the G-score, as uh, we have watched, uh, on, always has a, a minimum point. It's, it arrives to a number of Latin variables where it's, it, goes, it goes up again all the, uh, in all cases. So yeah, it really helps set a, a maximum at least. And yeah, most of the time is the optimal number of Latin variables comproved by, tested by the other data, data sets. So yeah, we can see more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can see a derivative. Yeah. This one has a derivative. Yeah, you can see why it's so low in the in the list because it's it's all noise. So yeah. This the first derivative? The second derivative, second I believe. Derivative. Yeah. It's really noisy, the performance is not good, it's down on the list. So yeah, makes sense. So yeah, sometimes it's like it's just the, the Savitsky Collide derivative, but as the spectra on the original spectra is very noisy, the Savitsky Collide doesn't smooth it out to have the second derivative. So yeah, even if it's tried, it's not a good model at all. But yeah, yeah you can order them by, by RMC, it's the same. The first yeah. one was in this in the in the case of J score was the seven. Which is nine point Gaussian, and with the case of RMC, is the the five point Gaussian, which is the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know if you have more questions. Oh, there's more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, Osman asks, uh, do you have any idea on how all these models will affect the degrees of freedom used for modeling? So, so in the sense that if you try six million different uh, things, maybe you will overfit just by trying so many things. Yeah, but the overfitting is really penalized by the, the regression vector noise. And the maximum number of preprocessing that I've tried at the same time is four, because we have four terms of preprocessing with if we the maximum is one 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 after the other is, is four. There is no more than four never. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, and one of them is auto scaling. So yeah. Yeah, uh, Osman is saying you you do still test a lot of different models. Yeah, but this compared to the full iteration will be this one is 137, and the full iteration is 855, if I believe correctly, for the same factors, the same levels. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's it's a uh, eighth of the time. Yeah, yeah. So you're doing better than that in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so uh, Osman is saying better than the existing design of experiment method, yes, and, and the model uh, optimizer. In terms of uh, computational time, yes. In yes. terms of results, yeah. we can't, we'll have to look it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, as Ricard, Ricard is saying, yeah, the, one of the, our ideas is to validate it using the, the three the sport, the DOE approach, and this approach for the same data set with an independent validation test, if it's if the, the obtained result is the same. Yeah. I have a question. Um the the J score, I really I really like that a lot. Uh, but I was thinking if you if you said one uh, minus, then yeah. you would try to maximize and then instead instead of minimizing. Oh yeah, good it's yeah. And and then you could actually instead of maximizing the sum, you could maximize the product. And and the nice thing about maximizing the product is that none of them can be low, you know, uh, and that might or might not. I'm not sure, but I think it it might be an interesting thing to look into. Whether you mean the geometrical mean, not the the, 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 the multiplying the three of them. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that, that was suggested by one of the reviewers of the paper. Um, <laughs> and yeah. and the, the results are exactly the same. If you do one, if you maximize... If you... you yeah, sorry. You have to turn it around and maximize instead of trying to minimize towards... Ah, you, the, mean, you mean putting ah. one minus to the other terms? To all three terms, put yeah. one minus, and then it makes sense to maximize the product. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. then all of them have to be good. Uh, you not. It's yeah, not well, 
work if one is off? No, but in this case, all of all three go to zero. So yeah, it's minimizing. I understand that, uh, but I think it would be different and interesting if you maximized and then uh, looked at the product. Okay. If you maximize and look at the sum, you get the same yeah. as you do. But if you maximize and look at the product, then it's it's a different priority. Okay. 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 Thanks. You know? yeah, yeah. There's more questions. What? Are, oh, there's many questions here. What about the results of testing data sets? Uh, That's not implemented yet. The toolbox only does cross validation. Right. Okay. Yes, okay, so that was the question here, yes. But if you have the selected the, the five uh, better models, you can do the five PLS yourself and see yeah. the rest. Yeah. And there's another question from Francesco. Uh, very nice, complete, uh, powerful tool. I have a question, a doubt. Could it work with qualitative analysis? That is, could we know which spectral pre-processing is the ideal one to apply, for example, a discriminant analysis? If we implemented it, yes, but it's only for PLS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's the basic toolbox. And yeah, of course, we know we can do it for PCA, we can do it for PLSDA, we can do it for even Simca, but yeah. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Well, for PLSDA, stuff and so on. You, you mentioned initially that the tool was meant for a certain type of data, uh, like NIR data, not, for example, mass spectral data. <laughs> so sometimes when you put these tools out, people are going to do silly things uh, like measuring uh, on free NIR samples or something. So I was just wondering, do you have an idea about when this is not working well? You know, when this method will... Yeah, well, this method really fails when you have heavy outliers. <laughs> And that's really important things. Yeah, you have to really care about the outliers because if you you maintain the, the outliers and do the process reprocessing with the outliers, probably the, the best model will be the preprocessing that minimizes minimizes the effect of those outliers, and that's what we don't want. Mm. Makes sense. And of course, we if, if you use other data like uh, NMR or mesospectrum, spectrum, it doesn't really work because of uh, some of the indicators that are included here, for instance, the noise index regression vector, only work with a continuous spectra. If you have zero values, missing values, or whatever, it doesn't work. That makes sense, yes. To be adapted, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Have you thought about variable selection? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of post toolboxes have to be added to this toolbox. Yeah, we know. <laughs> I know, but it's such a nice tool. I really like well, it. We, we are open for collaboration, Rasmus. You know that. Ah, that's good. Okay, we should talk. We should definitely talk. Yeah. For instance, this same toolbox could be coupled for with the sport. For instance, yeah. if you have selected the best, the best top uh, uh, preprocessings, you can do SOPLS with those. So yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yes.